are pretty on Ulysses. There it is. Just in case anybody's confused. Hello, booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and another Friday Reads. So I am I'm taking a chance, sneaking out at 6.30 in the morning, it's not even quite 6.30. Cloudy sky, thunderstorm warning, um, everything's wet, so including my bum now that I sat down on this bench. But I think I might just get away with it. I brought lots of plastic bags to cover my non my paper bags that I hold all these books out with and cover up my microphone if I have to make a mad dash back in the rain, but I've never, that's never happened yet, so let's tempt fate once again, shall we? I don't think I have any chatty news, because you don't want to hear what I think about the Olympics. You don't want to hear what I think about the fact that we have now almost 4,000 new cases of coronavirus a day. Thanks, Olympics. Thanks, Prime Minister Suga. And the fact that I'm not even able to try again to get my first and second vaccination thoughts shots until the middle of August. You don't want to hear any of that. So... Instead, let's talk about something positive. I have a new shirt. Uh, and I launched a new series. So I think there's a sizable percentage of you that only ever tune into Friday Reads. I think there's also a, 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 a group of you that maybe watch everything except Friday Reads. People like different things. But I am really quite pleased with this new series I launched last night, Tokyo time, called Bite Sized Book Chats, where I do short and snappy Zoom interviews with one reader from my social bookish social media feeds, one reader, one book, six, seven minute interview. I put the first episode up last night. I am delighted at the chance to talk to some former booktubers and some bookish friends, but also some complete strangers, because let's face it, you don't really know the people on your social media feeds, typically, and so it's really fun to bring them on to Zoom and chat about a book. I, I love it. So I'm going to be doing more in the future, and I just want to make sure that those of you who missed it might check it out. There's a link in the show notes. I actually forgot to bring my bail in all the excitement, but I told you last week I was going to try a misread book. Well, misread will remain miss on read in my department. I got about a chapter and a half in, and that was just really dull. Just, yeah, and I, and I kind of clinched it. It was Roz of Scally Dowling about the books that said she'd never read a book by Miss Reed in her life. And I thought, okay, Roz, that's my permission to bail because I was not... I've got a, a raindrop on my glasses. It's not spitting ra rain, is it? But I don't otherwise feel it raining, so please don't rain. <laughs> Just getting started here. Is it gonna rain? Anyway, so Roz, thank you for approving of my bail because I bailed because of you. I don't know what it was called. There's the gif. Uh, yeah, Miss Reed is uh, not a writer for me, I don't think. And uh, once again, I think that my luck with Dean Street Press uh, for Old Bitter Brow is maybe less than 50%. Can I finish them? So they publish a lot of crap, just like Persephone, but there's some gems in there. But I have finished four. This was a long-term buddy read with Britta Bowler of uh, this short story collection. Tony Cade Bambera's Gorilla My Love. Backlist, which is my bag. She died in 1995. This collection was published in 1972 and the stories had been published in literary journals from 1959 up to 1971. Loved it. I gave it four stars. There was quite a few stories that... There was enough stories that didn't really work for me that I couldn't give it five stars, but Many of them were delightful. Five star reads, 15 stories, lots with sassy young African American girls as narrators. Some of them felt a little dated by now, but a lot of them spoke directly to the moment in which we all find ourselves. I want to read much more. It's my first anything by Tony Cade Bambera, and I'm looking forward to more. I have finally finished my buddy read with Hannah of Hannah's Books, of, and Ange was with us for the first part, but then got busy with life stuff. The Adventures of Miss Barbara Pym by Paula Byrne. This is the new biography and it wasn't very good. It was probably, in terms of my enjoyment, I have to say it was probably a four-star read and I usually rate stuff really subjectively, but there was a lot objectively that was bad about this book. This is the second biography that I've read this year that I thought there's really no need for this new biography. 
other than that the last one is out of print you know the last one to be published is out of print um, I would read Hazel Holt's biography over this one and the one that I read uh, maybe last year or the year before that I did a review of I can't remember the, the author or the title but uh, those were better than this this uh, look at the, it's just a door stopper and so much detail that I don't think a lot of it was necessary I get why and this is heavy so I think I'm gonna put it down <laughs> There, was a, there is an excessive amount of detail about her love life and her sex life and she was someone who never married and had a very active love life, sex life when she was a younger woman right, in, until, until, you know, middle age, late middle age and she had a really neurotic... <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want a, somebody to write a biography of me, not that anybody will, but based on my journals and based on how screwed up my love life and sex life occasionally has been in my free Kenji past. Um, so there was things that I cringed, details that I cringed to see included here. But yet, that was the fodder, that was the inspiration for the wonderful novels that she wrote. All of her stuff is deeply, deeply autobiographical. So Paula Byrne had a point in kind of I mean, if you care, I mean, there are lots of readers, and I would say that I'm usually one of those kind of readers that absolutely doesn't care where the, who the character's based on in the author's life, but I don't object to knowing, but I don't care. So, yeah, I, I kind of was a push-pull struggle, because there, I just, anything about Barbara Pym, I'm interested, I think more than anything, what I knocked the star off down to a three-star read was the things that were, got short shrift. Hazel Holt was her biographer and her literary executor, but she was also one of her best friends. And while I'll never forgive Hazel Holt for hobbling together the, the drafts that, that mercifully Barbara Pym didn't bother to finish before she died, that was a gift to the universe not to have published that piece of crap, Hazel Holt hobbled it together and published it under Barbara Pym's name, and that was a huge mistake. It's just one of the worst novels ever written. But aside from that, I love Hazel, who just died a few years ago. She herself was a mystery novelist, but they were co-workers at the African Institute for decades and best friends, and she barely shows up in this book. When she does, it's usually, it's favorable, but I just felt that, I don't want to psychoanalyze the biography, but it felt like there was some kind of rivalrous attempt to kind of push her out of the record. In, in other words, I'm not sure that Barbara Pym's personal life would pass the Bechdel test, but this biography certainly doesn't, and so Hazel Holt is largely absent, and even more egregiously, the central relationship in Barbara Pym's life was with her sister, Hillary. She foresaw that when, at the age of about 20, she started writing her debut novel, Some Tame Gazelle. She um, projected into the future and imagined them as middle-aged spinsters living together and that actually happened but she had already written a novel about it <laughs> and you almost don't see Hilary Pym in this book that was just disgusting to me also not nearly enough about her relationship with other writers it's not like Paula Byrne ignores it but it gets crowded out by all this this fixation on every lurid and scandalous or neurotic detail about how Barbara Pym felt and thought and what she did romantically and sexually and I I don't mean this in a prudish way I just don't think it really added as much as what was subtracted by a lot of other important deeply important facets of Barbara Pym's life getting church trip so everybody's la 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 it's so good it's such a wonderful biography no it's not it's not very good read the older ones. This one was just one you could miss. There's some fantastic photos in here that I've never seen anywhere else, so, you know, steal a copy, borrow it from the library to look at the pictures, but read Hazel Holt or the other one. Now, I, I'm going to put the gif up of the other one and put it in the show notes because I'm blanking on the title and author of that one. I'm glad I read it. Gave me some new stuff to think about. I might do a a review or something, uh, but I, I usually re review everything by or about Barbara Pym that I read, but this one I don't really want to... I don't think it needs any more attention. It doesn't deserve the attention it's gotten, but it was not a complete waste of time. That 
is my definition of a three-star read. And I have finally finished this Malagasy novel, Beyond the Rice Fields by Naivo. This is for Invisible Cities back in 2019 or whenever it was the, the book of the month, the country of the month. I took my sweet time reading it. It was a fascinating novel that wasn't very good, or was, didn't, I didn't really like. Three stars. It's a historical novel set in the early 19th century and it is based on historical truth. It reads in... It reads like a fantasy novel, which is part of why I didn't like it, but it's almost everything in here happened. There was a evil queen, I won't try to pronounce her name, she clamped down on the Western Christian influence that was starting to overtake Madagascar in a way that was quite brutal, and the two main characters, Afera and her father's slave, Sito, um, got caught up in all of that. That's enough about the plot, except that I was fascinated by, what do you call it? The liar's test? The, um, the early 19th century Malagasy version of the polygraph test. The queen uh, would have the people that were accused of something, spying or betraying the country or whatever they were accused of, and they would be injected with a poison. Tangina is the Malagasy name for this species of tree native to Madagascar and it was uh, used um, for trials by ordeal so the seeds for this uh, tree this Tangina tree if I'm pronouncing it right Tangina um, were ex highly toxic very po were very poisonous and so they would be the the accused would be forced to swallow them and if they could puke them back up they were innocent if they died, they were guilty. And the use of this trial by ordeal in the reign of Queen Rana Valona, there I found it, Rana Valona, she reigned from 1828 to 1861. It's estimated that about 2% of the population of Madagascar died from this, these trials by ordeal with the Tangina plant. And that is um, dramatically narrated in the novel. Um, it's gotten me really interested in, Malaga in Malagasy history and literature and culture, the dance, the, the music. Um, the novel wasn't very good. and It was really hard to follow. Um, and I liked the challenge of trying to keep characters' names straight, but so many of them began with, were eight syllables long, and they all started with Andrian. Andrian or Shita or something, and, but they all started that same, those t first two syllables the same with these polysyllabic names and that was really confusing. So I just gave up following the intrigue of the political story, focused on the main characters, um, looked up all the historical stuff, and I, I'm glad I read it, but it wasn't my kind of book and there was this really horrifically sappy love story that just made me um, want to throw up, not the Tangina, but <laughs> The, the, the sentimental love story was, was uh, just not my bag at all. So, I want to read <coughs> something that's better, or more of a Sean book. But I'm glad that I read this because it introduced me to the culture. Naivo is um, the mercifully short one name, uh, pen name, of Naivo Harasoa Patrick Ramamonjisoa, and he is a Malagasy journalist living in Ottawa. This is the first Malagasy novel ever to be translated into English, so I recommend trying it. Um, I think there are, for a certain reader, it would be more more for them than it was for me, uh, but uh, I, will I will not forget it anytime soon. And the last book that I finished, and I am going to do a full review, and I really need more time to think about it, I finished this late last night, is the Booker Prize nominated novel, The Promise, by Damon Galgut. Uh, this was a buddy read with Bob the Booker, and I had so much going on last night, I wanted to finish off the books I've just talked about and finalize my bite-sized book chats video. So I haven't even had time to check in with Bob about the last chapter, but I loved it. It was, it was nothing other than a five-star read. It had flaws, and I need a few days to kind of puzzle over them. I think that 
the character work was a little bit too descended into the realm of character a little bit in the maybe the last couple chapters but I need to sit with that reaction certainly not enough to budge me off five stars but I'm just I'm not, just not sure how I feel I think I need to go back and reread a couple I didn't feel that all the there was a continuity between how some of the characters showed up when they were younger and how they were when they were older but I think life can be like that but I, I also found it sometimes jarring I don't want to dwell on it, I want to think about it. I want to dwell on it in an indwelling way before I talk much more about what might or might not be the flaws. What made this an absolutely phenomenal novel that I think is Booker Prize worthy is, I don't think I've read anything by a white writer that portrays the The workings of colonialist, racist thinking in a story embedded within its characters, but also draws it out of the reader. And I don't want to say much more about that. I think I maybe alluded to it last week, but, but those are some of the things that I want to think about and talk about in a full review. This was a spellbinding novel. Um, I don't think two white men in a row gay or not should win the booker but this is definitely a novel that I think almost anyone I know should read because I want to talk about it with them I want to go and I haven't gone back to watch Eric Carl Anderson's video but I can't remember in any precise detail what were the things that he commented on because it's different when you listen to a video like that or a review without having read it and so now that I've read it I want to go back and and listen to that but I think most of you would be uh, at least half as blown away as I am by this book which is as high a praise as I can think to give so yes the only one that I was planning to start was the misread and that didn't go well so because I seem to possibly have gotten past my deeply imprinted psychic allergy towards ghosts in literature I decided to pick one up that I almost on hauled when I did my book haul video and found out that a ghost was in the first paragraph the protagonist's dead sister who walks around in her bedroom in the opening paragraph and thought oh my god it's a ghost I can't and I put it on my bail my on haul pile and then after I had a very positive experience with there weren't, there weren't a lot of ghosts and the ghosts that were in the Damon Galgut novel um, didn't stay long. <laughs> they were, you know, they didn't overstay their welcome. But I just thought, you know, I don't think I should be quite so um, automatic about not trying a book because there's a ghost in it. Because it, that really worked in The Promise. So all of that, that long preamble is to say that the book that I pulled off the on haul pile and have completely become besotted by is this British novel from about 1997, The Traveling Horn Player by Barbara Trapido. And goodness, I am just loving the first, I, I love the first 30 pages so much. The ghost doesn't stick around, but we're getting the backstory. The surviving sister is remembering from just about three or four years ago that her high school age sister was killed in a freak pedestrian uh, motor vehicle accident moments after uh, dropping off not a love letter per se but kind of a almost a love letter in the form of a draft piece of writing that she was working on at the home of a married novelist acquaintance of hers did you follow all that so what a tragic way to go the characters are weird in a way that i just i'm so emotionally connected to them and i the the relationship between the sisters was so playful and they had these weird private jokes and stuff that are just a delight to read about. I don't know where it's going, but I am absolutely in love with it based on the first 30 pages. Have you heard that before? Let's stay positive. I hope that continues because this one has really grabbed me by the throat with all the stuff about bookers and things going on and this and that. This is the one that has just grabbed hold of me. So, 
Yay for the backlist! Well, I can see blue sky, so I think I'm going to be lucky. This week only, I have decided to suspend my two books finished, one book started algorithm <laughs> to whittle down my currently reading. Now that I've finished those four books, and I will be finishing one more on the weekend, so after I finish the one on the weekend, I'll be down to 21 books, which is, I think is a quite a manageable number of current reads. But I'm not going to only allow myself to start two, I'm going to start four, because the Booker long list is out. I'll put a link to my reaction video. So I want to start two for that. Women in Translation Month starts early next week, so I want to start two for that. So that's what I'll tell you about. Plus, do you know what? I'm going to start with the one because it's an ebook that I'm liable to forget. And that is the next short story collection that I'll be buddy reading with Britta starting tomorrow. We'll read the first story. The book is called The Pain Tree by Olive Senior, an Olive uh, 2015 collection, I believe. And Olive Senior is a Caribbean Canadian writer. She divides her time, I think, between Jamaica and Canada now. But we claim her as a Canadian writer, and this is a collection of short stories. So I have never read anything by her. I'm looking forward to giving it a try. There, that was the one I was worried I was going to forget because it's I don't have a book. I will be starting Sanjeev Sahota's Booker Longlisted novel, China Room. I adored his uh, 20, maybe 2015 novel, The Year of the Runaways. It's one of the best books ever to come out of the UK. Certainly it is, I would say, it is the best book to come out of the UK by a man in the uh, 20th century, hands down. So I have high hopes for this. I then went on to read his debut, Hours of the Streets, and it was awful, but The Year of the Runaways was a very, very uh, memorable read. So this one I hope will be too. And this is one of the marmitiest books on the long list. No one is talking about this by Patricia Lockwood. I just got this delivered to me the other day. Yeah, it's a Twitter novel, so that's either going to work for me or it's not. How's that for a profound prediction? But I've heard glowing reviews and very negative reviews. I will have something to say about it uh, by this time next week. Before I show you the two that I'm starting for Win in Translation Month, and I, I'm going to try to hold off on these and start not, not start until August 1st, but ch I'm kind of chomping at the bit to, to get into them. I want to tell you about a change to my Women in Translation TBR. So whatever that Greek novel was by Margarita Lasky's daughter, I think her name was Margarita Karanpo, Karanpo. I'll put the gif up. Electra is, not a, is probably not able to join us for a Zoom chat. She's just got a crazy month in August. Just found that out a couple days ago. So um, it was supposed to be my friend Electra, who is Greek, and Cecilia from Singapore, who was the, the final guest on last night's debut episode of Bite Sized Book Chat, and I, that we're going to read it and discuss it in a Zoom chat, just like we did last year during Women in Translation Month with Margarita Liberaki's novel, the, her mother's novel. But Electra's just crazy busy, so she couldn't really commit to doing it. So Cecilia and I decided we don't want to do it without Electra. So Cecilia and I have chosen something else, and if on the off chance Electra can kind of clear her schedule and join, she might still join us for the book chat on this. And this is the one that I was so um, impressed by the opening paragraph in my book haul video the other day. The Bridge of Beyond by Simone Schwartz Bart, uh, translated from the French by Barbara Bray, and uh, I'll put a link to that just if you want to get the taste, because that opening paragraph was to die for. So Cecilia and I, and perhaps Electra, will be reading it later in August and doing a Zoom chat. The Zoom chat may not go up during Women in Translation Month. I will do my best, but um, we will chat about it at the end of August. I can't wait. So I'm not starting that this week, no, but I just wanted to let you know, because I know you're all following you're all doing a checklist of how closely I adhere to my TBR. So this is a late breaking change. The first one that I'll be starting for Women in Translation Month is this novel translated from the Bosnian, Catch the Rabbit by Lana Bastasic, and she herself translated it into English. One of the, one of the protagonists ends up in 
It's kind of a road novel between sisters, and one of the sisters ends up in Dublin, and the Irish novelist Ronan Hessian and I will be buddy reading it together. I think it's his first buddy read ever, and it's my first buddy read with him, obviously. And so he's got all he's got hooked into Voxer, and we're gonna check in once a week and read it over, I think, three weeks. The reviews of this have been quite favorable, so I'm really excited. I don't love the cover. Do you? Do you like these colors? I don't think these colors all go together, but it does match my new, my new booktuber shirt. And then the other one that I want to start this week because it's maybe the ch one of the chunkiest books on my wit month TBR is this Indian novel, Women Dreaming by Salma, translated from the Tamil by the noted uh, Indian novelist Meena Kandasamy. And yeah, it's uh, almost 400 pages. It's about a group of Tamil women in a tiny Muslim village in Tamil Nadu. So that sounds incredible. I can't wait to start. Oh, August is going to be so great. Is there anything else? I have a special video uh, for Women in Translation Month that I hope to post maybe Sunday. But if not, it'll be early next week. So stay tuned for that. It's one of my secret projects. And the other secret projects, you'll have to probably wait till later in the month. I am so bookishly stoked right now, I can barely contain myself. I hope something similar is going on for you. Thanks for watching.